I'm going to try to keep this on for as long as I can today, but I don't have my contacts in. I look like Paula punched me in the eye. She really didn't, I promise. <laughs> uh, got a spy on one of my eyes, and so contacts are out, and old glasses are in, and it's fogging up. So we're going we're gonna to do the best we can. Real quickly, well, you feel like playing happy birthday? I was just reminded that we had a birthday this week. Yeah, I have a birthday too. <laughs> Jax? Jax? Do you have a birthday? How old are you now? 16? No. Not. Are you ready to drive yet? No. <laughs>
the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the, that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a casual. Pray with me if you would. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time we have together. Lord, we thank you for the blessings of life. And God, I thank you this morning that you set ways and plans in motion for our lives that we could someday inherit a home in heaven with you. And Lord, the devil is surely working overtime. He's trying everything within his power to attack the church, to attack the Christians in this world. But Lord, we know that you have power over him, you have power over this earth, you have power over all things. And so this morning, Lord, come and dwell with us as the Holy Spirit and reassure us of your plan in our lives. Lord, reassure us that you are with us no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're going through. And Lord, I pray that this morning that your presence would be felt by each and every one of us. God, this morning, if there are those who are struggling with health issues, Lord, I pray that you'd be the great physician to them. Lord, for those that are dealing with emotional, spiritual issues, I pray that you would touch and bless them in a mighty way. God, for those on our prayer list and those in our community, Lord, those who are hurting, I just pray that you would bless each one. Lord, well, we thank you. We praise you for what you've done and what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Maybe see. Thank you for standing there with me. Once there was a millionaire who had co he collected live alligators, and he kept them in a swimming pool in the back of his mansion. The millionaire also had a beautiful daughter who was single. One day he decided to throw a huge party, and during the party he announced, he said, My dear guest, I have a proposition to every single man here. I'll give you $1 million, or my daughter, her hand in marriage, to the man who can swim across this pool of alligators and emerge alive. As soon as he finished his last word, there was a sound of a large splash. Everybody turned to see there was one guy in the pool swimming with all he could and screaming out of fear. The crowd cheered him on as he kept on stroking as though he was running for his life. Surely he was. Finally, he made it to the other side with only a torn shirt and some minor injuries, and the millionaire was very impressed. He said, my boy, that was incredible. It's fantastic. I don't think, I didn't think it could be done. But I must keep up my end of the bargain. Which do you want? My daughter's hand in marriage or the one million dollars? The guy said, listen, I don't want your money. I don't want your daughter. He said, I want to know the guy that pushed me in that water. Wait for a wrestling match. Logan and Zach got to do a little swimming this week. Hey, uh, uh, oh, we got, we got to share that video. Let them see them riding that. They were tubing at the lake. With some friends of ours. Yeah, the other day they did that. And uh, came out with scuffs and scratches and looked like you'd been in a fight or something. So apparently that, uh, that water was kind of tough on them, I think. But uh, the braver than I am, I'll guarantee you, if they knew what was in the water, I'm going to be done that. As I was preparing for this message, I thought about coming out here with sweatbands on and gold medals and all that to try to come out and look as if I was an Olympic runner or an Olympic medalist. But my fruits tell another story. You can tell by looking at me that I'm obviously not that person. I believe that there are lots of things about the Christian life that are very important right now, very timely. I believe church attendance is vitally important to each and every Christian. If you don't believe me, take a look at Hebrews 10.25. And I'm thankful for each and every one of you that are here today. I'm humble and I'm grateful for the growth that God has given this church over the past six or seven years. But you know what? Attendance is not going to be what gets us into heaven. The way we act, the things we say, how you treat others outside these four walls, they tell the true story of your faith. They exemplify or illustrate or demonstrate the change that has taken place within us when we become a child of God. This morning I want us to take a look at ways that we can train for this match or this race that we call life. 
We're not training for a gold, silver, or bronze medal. Only first place will do. And for that, we will receive a crown of life. We mentioned this morning that one of our neighbors, John Van Sears, passed away. And I, I, you know, when you when you think about for the Christian, for the Christian crossing that finish line, that's victory. That's if you can make it there, and you're a child of God, folks, you've done it. You know, I've shared with with the church before, and I believe this wholeheartedly. You know, a lot of times. We tend to look at salvation. Once somebody gets saved, then that's it. You can relax. You've done all you've got to do. You've crossed the finish line. But it's just the beginning. Salvation is a journey. And just like that race that, that we're talking about, there are going to be ups and downs, hills and valleys, hardships and, 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 and victories along the way. But along with that crown of life, we're going to inherit an eternity in heaven, spent praising the Lord who made all that possible through the shedding of his precious blood. I want to be there. And this morning, I hope that you do too. First, I want to talk about diet. You know, when, when an athlete is, is training, they have to be concerned about their diet. Everywhere we turn, we see diet foods, low-carb, low-fat, sugar-free. It can all get very confusing. But feeding the soul should be much more easier to understand. The staple of our spiritual diet must be the bread of life. In John 6, 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whosoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whosoever believes in me shall never thirst. Now, bread is considered a staple food, a, diet, a basic dietary item. A person can survive a long time on simply bread and water. Bread is such a basic food item that it becomes synonymous with food in general. When we even use the phrase breaking bread together to indicate sharing a meal with someone. Bread also plays an integral part in the uh, Jewish Passover meal. The Jews were to eat unleavened bread during the Passover feast and then for seven days following as a celebration of the exodus from Egypt. Finally, when the Jews were wandering in the desert for 40 years, God rained down bread from heaven to sustain the nation. You remember what happened when Jesus referred to himself as the bread of life? He lost some followers because they thought he literally meant that they were to eat his flesh. Like they were going to be, become carnivores or something. Or, or uh, that they were going to eat him. First, by equating himself with bread, Jesus is saying he is essential for life. Second, the life Jesus is referring to is not physical, but eternal life. Jesus is trying to get the Jews thinking off the physical realm into the spiritual realm. He is contrasting what he brings as their Messiah with the bread of life, miraculously created the day before. That was physical bread that perishes. He is spiritual bread that brings eternal life. And I apologize, folks. I promise I won't stomp and spit and snort, but I'm going to have to lose that, that last this morning. Just as Jesus lost followers when he made that statement, we will lose people when we tell them that they must eat the bread of life and resist eating the sinful buffet that this world offers. Now, I'm sure many Olympic athletes would rather eat Big Macs and pizza, but while they're focused on training for the next match, they know they must stick to the strictest of diets. And I'm here to tell you today, friends, we've got to do the same thing with our spiritual lives. A few moments of pleasure or thrills are not worth losing an eternity in heaven. The Bible says God has placed the desire for eternity in our hearts. In Ecclesiastes 3.11, the Bible also tells us that there is nothing we can do to earn our way to heaven because in Romans 3.23 tells us we've all sinned. Excuse me. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible goes on to tell us that the wages of sin is death. So we start out life behind the eight ball. We are, we are, we're doomed Spiritually speaking, to hell. And people that want to, to equate our actions, our deeds with getting us into heaven, see, 
That's that's the the, the, the flip side of, of this agreement because I know that I have done so much wrong in my life that I can never get to heaven. I can never do enough right to undo the wrong and then achieve a trip to heaven on my own. I don't want to get into that way of thinking that, that I'm going to earn my way into heaven. Romans 3.10 says there is none who is righteous in himself. None of us. Our dilemma is we have a desire that we cannot fulfill no matter what we do. That's where Jesus comes in. He, he alone can fulfill the desires of our hearts the righteousness through a divine transaction. He was the one that made a way for us to go to heaven. For our sake he made him to be sin, he who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, said Corinthians 5.1 says. When Christ died on the cross, he took the sins of all mankind, all of my sins, all of your sins, upon himself. To pay a price we couldn't pay. To achieve something that we could never deserve. God's Next, after diet, we, we've got to exercise our faith. Just as athletes devote countless hours to physical exercise, we've got to be willing to do the same for our spiritual lives. Instead of running around a track, we must develop spiritual endurance. I love Hugh's prayer there. It's almost like he had read some of my notes there. Talking about the importance of prayer, the importance of studying God's Word and being a better Christian. In Ephesians 6, 14 and 15, we're told to stand firm then with the belt of truth fastened around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness arrayed, and with your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Electric runners must wear expertly engineered, high-dollar running shoes. But we need to be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The very next phrase says, in addition to all of this, make up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. That tells me that God wants us to share the gospel of peace, but be vigilant, be prepared for the attacks of the devil. How else can we exercise our faith? By reading God's word, not just at church when the preacher reads it aloud, but at home on your own time. <coughs> Study to show thyself approved is what the Apostle Paul wrote in his second letter to Timothy. I believe we'll see a day come, and I hope it's not while I'm here on earth with my children, but I, I truly believe that a day will come when the Bible's not as easy for us to get our hands on. I don't know if it's going to be like it is in places like China where it's illegal to possess a Bible, but I believe that the time will come when they're not as a Bible. Right now you can go to most houses of Christian people and you can find Bibles all over the place. We've got one that we were given when we got married. It's a white Bible. It's about that thick. I've opened it up a couple of times, but, but you know, it, it, it's, it's almost more for, for, for appearance than, than for use. It's not designed for, for everyday use. The people have, have Bibles in their houses that have got dust on them that thick. I read somewhere some, uh, sometime, I don't remember who said it, but a Bible that has fallen apart is usually attached to a life that is not. See, those people that use that Bible day in and day out, study God's Word, not just read it, but study it. It'll make a difference in your life. And I've heard people say, Matt, I, I, try, I try to read it and I, I just have a hard time understanding it. I do too. But if we pray before we open that word, if we pray and just ask God to, to take us to where he wants us to be in his word and, and to make it where we can understand it, make it comprehensible, he'll do that for us. Not on our own, but through him we can do it. don't know God's word well enough, if you don't feel like you know God's word well enough, join the crowd. I venture to say most all of us fall into that category. I know I 
We meet here every Wednesday night at 6 o'clock to study, to show ourselves approved in looking to His Word. What about hitting your knees in prayer? God wants us to bring our needs to Him in faith, no matter how big or how small. When we entrust God with our needs and requests, we're not only exercising our faith, but I believe we're increasing it. We're growing it stronger and more focused, which will allow or also help us to run the race in life. And lastly, if you're training to succeed, you've got to follow the plan. It's been a few years since Rick played basketball for the Golden Tide, but you all have plans. You have plays that you use, right? Sure. It's strategy. There's a plan that we've got to follow in this life if we want to make it to heaven. Christ set up a plan of salvation for us 2,000 years ago so that you and I would know what to do to make it to heaven. Now, different churches use different names for this plan. They're on the road. Some churches call it, you know, they, they don't focus on scriptures in, um, in, in the book of Romans. Nothing wrong with that. Some Christian churches talk about the five fingers of salvation. Nothing wrong with that. Because at the root, at the base, they all agree with what our situation is and what we've got to do. Now, I like to teach people to use the four spiritual laws developed by Campus Crusades for Christ decades ago because we've got tracks back there. If you want some, I've got them, and, and I'll be glad for you to take them. And, and they're easy to understand. Bill Adcock, during his time here, he taught us how to do it. I carry one in my wallet because I'm telling you, I don't trust my memory. But on more than one occasion, I pull this out when somebody has asked about salvation, wanting to know what to do to be saved. And it takes you through. Got four, four steps. One, God loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life. Two, man is sinful and he's separated from God. Thus, he cannot know and explain God's plan for life. Three, Jesus is God's provision for man's sin through whom Man can know God's love and plan for his life. And four, we must receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. I don't care what church you go to. That's true. That's biblical truth. I carry that tract in my wallet. I've got some, like I said, in the office back there. If you want one, I'd be glad for you to take it. Because you never know when God will give you the opportunity to lead somebody to salvation. And folks, um, I, I, I heard a Baptist preacher preach a sermon one Sunday, and, and, uh, and I was just there visiting. But, you know, it was almost like he was preaching to me because he said, when we stand before that judgment seat, one of the things that, that he believed, and I agree, I believe that God's going to ask, is how many people did you bring to know me? How many people did you lead to salvation? Now, you might play a role in somebody's. Salvation by planting a seed, by being an encourager. You may not be holding their hand when they do it. You may have played a role before they got to that point. But I believe he's going to expect an answer from us. Like any good athlete or any Olympian, you've got to know the plan. You've got to know what you're going to do to follow through with your goal. And that's just as important as either of the other steps. Like I said earlier, I'm not going to sell for a gold or silver or bronze medal. And I sure don't want to leave this walk of life with a participation trophy. Hell is full of people who were satisfied with just going through life, having a good time. Maybe they showed up for church every once in a while. Maybe they read the Bible a few times. Maybe they prayed when they really got in a bind, but that was the only time when they needed God was the only time they prayed. That's not me, folks. I settle for nothing less than a crown of life. That's what I want when I get to heaven. It's not because it's about the crown of life, but it's because it's where I'm going to be when I get it. When I take my last breath here, and it's followed immediately by my first breath in the presence of Jesus Christ. Folks, that's what's going to be worth it all.
every sacrifice that I made, every minute that I spent doing something that God wanted me to do instead of what I wanted to do, it's all going to be worth it. That died on the bread of life, that exercise in our faith, knowing the plan. That's what it's all going to be worth it, folks. This morning, I don't know where you are in your relationship with Christ. I don't know if you've ever trusted Him as your Savior. But that's what we've got to do. We've got to be willing to trust Him. What gets us in trouble, a lot of times we trust ourselves. We rely on ourselves rather than relying on Him. That's what gets us in trouble. On my own, I will mess things up most of the time. But he's never led me down a path that I shouldn't be on. He's never taken me to a place that he wouldn't bring me out of. This morning, God's got great plans for you. If you will trust him as your Savior, I want you to stand with me.